the Dalmatian. The Dalmatian is truly unique, beginning with its characteristic spotted coat, which led the breed to cinema celebrity, thanks to the Walt Disney cartoon 101 Dalmatians. Scientists have also discovered that the red blood cells of the Dalmatian are not round like those of other dogs, but oval like a camel. Moreover, the Dalmatian eliminates between 400 and 600 milligrams of uric acid per day, a quantity way above that of all other breeds, which eliminate between 10 and 60 milligrams per day. It is not easy to establish the origins of this breed, which is recognized in the Fédération Sinologique Internationale as native to the ex-Yugoslavia. The name itself seems to derive from Dalmatia, where the ancestors of this dog arrived from the east, or perhaps from nearby Greece, to be crossbred with the local Istrian pointer. It is probable that the ancient branch from which it originates has very remote roots, and this can be deduced from relics of Oriental, Greek and Egyptian civilizations, on which dogs with a very similar coat to the modern Dalmatian were depicted. Some experts suggest that it descends from a now extinct Asian breed, the Bengali Brak, which had a spotted coat on a tan base, not white. This dog may be the one mentioned by Linnaeus as the Canis variegatus and depicted in Eastern monuments. An English sinologist writing under the pseudonym of Eidston mentions an antique print dated 1556 showing a dog with a lean but solid skeleton, described as somewhere between the scent hound of the southern counties and a greyhound white with small black spots. In 1792, the sinologist Thomas Berwick suggests that the breed originates from Dalmatia and describes the elegant form between a foxhound and a setter, but with a longer, narrower skull and a white coat with small, irregular black or liver-colored spots. The pure breed has brown cheeks and black ears and is much smaller in size than the Great Dane. Other authors indicate the Great Dane in its ancient form as the ancestor of the Dalmatian, saying that once it reached the coasts of Dalmatia with the invading Galani, it crossbred with local dogs, undergoing a somatic change. This theory was accepted by many, above all in France, where the dog was once known as the Petit Danois, or Little Dane, with obvious reference to the Harlequin Great Dane. In the 50s, the Dalmatian was also known as the Chien Courant de Dalmati, Chien Courant being a scent hound, and this suggests that originally the dog was mainly used for hunting. According to another theory, the breed was present in Dalmatia from 1070 and was known as the Chien Courant de Dubrovnik. From here, it arrived in Great Britain by traders and travelers. By the 18th century, the Dalmatian was quite common in England. It was known as the coach dog because it trotted behind carriages and defended the occupants from highwaymen. In the 19th century, it became fashionable to enhance a horse and carriage or a mount by adding some Dalmatians, as witnessed by many English prints. In 1890, in England, the first known club was founded for the safeguarding of the breed, which risked extinction. Today, the Dalmatian is well known, and it is widespread in both Europe and America. In recent times, the Fédération Sinologique Internationale has adopted the breed and the debatable indication of the countries that border the central Mediterranean have been indicated as the place of origin of the Dalmatian. 
The standard has been subject to a number of drafts, all imprecise with reference to the head and the body. The changes made over the years mainly concern the height at the withers. The first official standard for the Dalmatian dates from 1882 and was drawn up in England by Vero Shaw. In the 1940s, the standard mentions a dog similar overall to the pointer, strong and symmetrical, resistant to fatigue. The height at the withers varied between 50 and 55 centimetres and the weight was given at around 25 kilos for dogs and a little less for bitches. The coat must have a white base without any ticking and the marks must be black or dark brown liver. The marks present on the body must be larger than those on the tail, the legs and the head. The presence of a lot of small spots increases the prestige of the coat. In the 60s, the standard was updated, and in the paragraph, General Appearance, we read that the Dalmatian is a strong, active, muscular dog, well-balanced, never clumsy or excessively heavy, with considerable resistance, fairly fast. It is therefore a dog that differs in size according to the sex. Dogs are between 55 and 60 centimetres, while bitches are between 50 and 55 centimetres. As far as the coat is concerned, it must be emphasised that the spots must be well separated, round and well defined. The more they are distinct, the greater the prestige of the coat. The spots must be about 2 to 3 centimetres in diameter, according to the standard. The marks on the head, on the muzzle, on the ears, on the legs and on the tail will be smaller. In 1983, a new standard was issued, which differed from the previous one only in the height of the withers, which was established at 55 to 61 centimetres for dogs and 50 to 58 for bitches. A later standard became official in 1988, again changing the size. Measurements varied between 58.4 and 61 centimetres for dogs and 55.9 and 58.4 for bitches. In 1992, a new standard was issued, but like the previous ones, is lacking in information about the head and body. The height at the withers varied between 56 and 61 centimetres for dogs and 54 and 59 for bitches. The ideal weight was also indicated, around 27 kilos for dogs and 24 kilos for bitches. As far as the general appearance is concerned, the standard says that for the Dalmatian, the new yellow marks are a characteristic aspect of the coat. The Dalmatian is a vigorous, strong and muscular dog, harmonious in shape, never clumsy or heavy, resilient and capable of moving quickly. The coat of the Dalmatian must be short, fine and dense, smooth and lustrous. The colour presents a number of difficulties in the selection because not all subjects are born with correctly placed marks. The standard foresees a pure white coat with black or liver coloured spots. The spots must be numular, round, well separated, of 2 to 3 centimetres in diameter. The marks on the head, the tail and the legs must be smaller than those on the body. The marks must not be too close together, nor too widespread, nor must they overlap. They stand out on the white coat and must have black well-marked edges without bleeding into the other colours. There are no rules about the positioning of the marks, but they must give an overall sensation of harmony and elegance. A coat with large blobs, monocle-shaped marks or a tricolour coat, black and liver spots on the same dog, will be considered disqualifying faults. Not everyone knows that the Dalmatian is born totally white, with only a trace of pigment on the nose. The characteristic spots begin to appear after 10 days, first on the neck and ears, then along the back and finally on the rest of the body.
At birth, there may be marks of color, black or liver, around the eyes. Liver-spotted dogs can be mated with extreme care to avoid compromising the pigmentation. The head of the Dalmatian is dolichocephalic, that is, longer than wider, and the upper profiles of the skull and the muzzle, the craniofacial axes, are parallel. The skull is as long as the muzzle and must be flat. It is widest between the ears and must not show any wrinkles. The stop must be well developed. The muzzle is long and powerful, deep and never snipey. In the black spotted dogs, the nose is always black, while it is brown in the liver spotted variety. The Dalmatian has a full set of teeth, 42 teeth in the adult dog, and a scissor bite. That means that when the mouth is closed, the upper teeth overlap the lower teeth, so that they just touch each other back to front. The eyes are not too distant, medium-sized, round, alert and bright. They give the dog an intelligent expression. They are dark in dogs with black spots and brown in liver-spotted dogs. The ears are set high, medium length and quite wide at the base. They are pendant and hang close to the head. They taper to a rounded tip. The ears are thin and covered in fine hair with numerous small spots. The neck is medium in length, well muscled, tapering towards the head. There must be no dewlap, loose skin under the chin. The shoulders are moderately sloping, strong and muscular. The legs are solid, muscular and perfectly straight. The feet are round, well arched and closed. The nails are black and white in black spotted dogs, brown and white in liver spotted dogs. The standard is not very precise regarding the body, but the length must correspond to the height of the withers. It is therefore a square-bodied dog, but it is not a serious fault if the body is slightly rectangular. In the dog, the length of the body is measured from the tip of the shoulder and the tip of the ischium, while the height is measured at the withers, just above the shoulder blades. The tail is strong at the beginning and tapers towards the tip, which reaches the hocks. It must never be clumsy and is carried with a slight upward curve, but not rolled. The tail must be set correctly to allow the correct shimitar position. It is desirable for there to be small marks on the tail, although some dogs have a completely white tail. Faults in the tail, such as a tendency to curl up, are considered very serious since they are easily transmitted to the offspring. Overall, the tail must not be too heavy or clumsy or it will detract from the elegance of the dog. A tail carried high is always a sign of confidence. When it is lowered, it shows fear or disquiet. The gait of the Dalmatian is free, uniform, powerful, rhythmic with a long stride. Seen from behind, the legs must move in parallel. The prints of the hind feet must cover those of the forefeet. A short stride is considered a serious fault because it tires the dog uselessly. The character. Selective breeding influences the character of any canine breed, and the breeder must make responsible decisions about which dogs to breed from, not only based on aesthetic requirements, but also on psychological characteristics. Each dog has its own personality, but a serene and balanced character must be a basic factor in the selection of any breed. In past centuries, the Dalmatian was appreciated for its hunting skills, which have dwindled over time, almost completely disappearing. Today, the Dalmatian is a good guard dog, but never unnecessarily aggressive with strangers. It loves its master and all the members of the family, and human contact is essential for the complete development of its character. 
It is not always possible for it to live in groups with other dogs because dangerous antipathies may develop. From the earliest months of life, it is responsive and learns easily. In fact, it is important to take advantage of the dog's character while it is young, assisted by its notable sensitivity. The Dalmatian is agile, dynamic and lively. It always conveys a sense of fun. It lives happily in the home, but it is essential to allow it to express all its vitality in daily runs in wide open spaces. Although the Dalmatian traditionally and instinctively acts as a guard dog, the owner must treat it correctly in order to improve its reliability. In general, it is important to remember that a guard dog's capability can be weakened by unsuitable living conditions, such as the mistaken habit of keeping a dog on a chain by day and freeing it at night. It is impossible to leave the dog free at all times. It is better to keep it in a run rather than tying it up. Another common error is to keep the dog constantly on the property. It must encounter new stimulus, both smells and sounds, if it is to develop that useful instinct of territorialism that makes a good guard dog. The dog's world is mainly made up of scents, the other senses being less useful. A walk outside the property is an excellent opportunity for developing the effective relationship between the owner and the dog. Essential if the dog is to be totally reliable and obedient in all circumstances. The Dalmatian is an alert dog, always aware of its owner's wishes and ready to obey. Coming when called is an obvious expression of the profound affection that the dog feels for its master. Initially, it is important not to call it without a reason. At all times, the name and the order must be pronounced sharply to attract the dog's attention. If the dog appears unwilling, it is possible to use a simple system that usually gives good results when repeated a few times. Extend the lead with a rope so that the dog can move away a few meters. When it is busy sniffing at the ground, call it firmly. If the dog does not obey, pull the rope and repeat the order. Once the dog comes, praise it and pat it, and after a while, allow it to move away again. After a few minutes, repeat the operation. Another frequent situation occurs when our Dalmatian has to allow a stranger to enter the property in the presence of its master. On entering, the stranger might show apprehension or even fear. A dog that perceives this will become hostile. In this case, the master must hold the dog by the collar or the lead. Once the stranger has entered, therefore being accepted by the master, the stranger can pat the dog. At this stage, the Dalmatian will show all the patience and gentleness because it likes company. More generally, it is important to remember that any guard dog, if it is to do its job well, must feel gratified and therefore, when the puppy runs to the gate barking to signal the presence of a stranger, it is necessary for the person to move away. This will make the dog feel like a winner and it will become more confident. A proper diet is essential to your dog's correct and full development so as to be able to keep it in perfect shape and health. Some people believe that dogs can eat virtually anything and therefore give their dogs all kinds of food, often recycling the leftovers from their own meals. This is a serious mistake, since what may be digestible to us and a source of nourishing substances often cannot be digested by dogs or is unable to be metabolized. A final piece of advice. It sometimes happens that a dog loses its appetite and refuses food for one or even two days. 
this is a normal occurrence, and in these cases it is a good rule not to always leave a full bowl of food down for the dogs. Instead, the food should be removed after a short time. Present the bowl of food again at the following mealtime after having changed its contents. In the event of loss of appetite lasting for more than two days without the presence of side symptoms, or if it is accompanied from the outset by symptoms of general suffering or exhaustion, consult your vet immediately. It is very likely to be an ordinary ailment, but in this case it is not worth taking a risk, and it is better to seek reassurance from an expert. We will now begin with a brief description of a dog's digestive apparatus. As in all carnivores, the stomach is of large dimensions, whereas the intestine is relatively short. Initial digestion in the stomach takes from three to eight hours. Then the food passes into the intestine, where the nourishing substances are assimilated, which are then transmitted to all the organs through the blood. The stomach's large capacity and the slow digestion process allow abundant meals to be eaten at fairly spaced out intervals. Naturally, to keep dogs in excellent health, it is necessary to provide them with all the elements that they require, that is, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, and minerals. When dogs were carnivorous predators, these elements were assimilated by dogs through the animals that they hunted and which were generally herbivores. Afterwards, civilization has led it to feed differently, but it will always be necessary to provide dogs with the appropriate substances. Dogs produce energy from their diet, which is then used for the maintenance of vital functions and movement. The more active a dog is, the greater the energy intake it will require. Without going into detailed food studies that would require a specific treatise, we can simply say that dogs particularly require fats or lipids, both of animal and vegetable origin, and it is these which provide the necessary energy and which accumulate in the organism to provide possible energy reserves. The proteins that make up the large part of the animal's body are also essential. These are indispensable to the formation of all the tissues, especially muscles, and also constitute the basis of hormones and the blood. They therefore represent an irreplaceable element in a proper diet, even more so in puppies which must build their bodies. Sources of protein are meat, cheese, eggs and fish which are well digested by dogs and also soya bean flour, peanuts, legumes which are however digested with more difficulty. An excess of proteins is harmful and can lead to various kinds of disorders depending on the conditions. Carbohydrates are not essential to a dog's diet. They are however very useful at the end of pregnancy. Starch which is the most important carbohydrate present in the diet, is poorly digested by dogs and needs to undergo preliminary treatment such as cooking, flaking, etc. This is why if you use pasta or rice as a food for your canine friend, it needs to be boiled for a long time to eliminate a large part of the starch present. Fiber, which often accompanies carbohydrates, is especially useful in the diet of sedentary dogs since it helps to prevent constipation, given the speed with which it passes through the alimentary tract. Vitamins are also necessary, even if in infinitesimal amounts. They are found in many vegetables and are synthesized by herbivorous animals. This is the reason why when a carnivore kills its prey, generally herbivorous, it immediately feeds on the intestines, where there are residues of partially digested vegetable matter. This also explains why, to your considerable annoyance, your dog often eats the excrement of herbivorous animals as soon as it gets the chance. A buildup of vitamins can be harmful, and therefore, if you use pre-prepared feed, you should carefully check the substances contained in the feed before adding supplements, and if in doubt, consult your vet. Minerals are essential to the diet and are supplied by foods. Efficiency in certain minerals such as calcium, iron, potassium, sodium, copper, and others can cause abnormal growth in puppies also with serious consequences and general debility in adult dogs or the onset of problems of varying degrees. There is excellent pre-packed feed on the market, both moist and dry types, that provide all the necessary elements for initial growth and to then keep your dog in top shape. 
Even if you use pre-packed feed, you will, however, be able to give some fruit or other food which your dog will find tasty, taking care not to exaggerate and not to give harmful substances such as sweets, fried foods, rice dishes, fresh or soft doughy bread that are extremely harmful and which can also have very serious long-term consequences. Instead, if you want to prepare the food yourself, then follow the advice of the breeder who sold you the dog or your vet's advice. As a general rule, it is worth knowing that meat, ideally beef, is essential. If pork meat is given, it must be well cooked in order to avoid infections. Poultry, meat and rabbit are also fine, provided that they are completely boneless. Giblets, although less rich in nourishing substances, are well liked. Fish is an excellent food and is best given cooked. It is particularly advisable for low-fat diets for dogs with digestive or skin problems. It is also an excellent means with which to make the diet less monotonous. Eggs are appetizing and supply many nourishing substances. They are particularly advisable for puppies and suckling females. Yolks can be consumed raw, whereas the albumin should always be cooked. Fats, such as lard and oil, are always readily accepted by dogs and are particularly useful during moments of work or physical effort. One or two teaspoonfuls of oil added to food are always beneficial. Dry bread is a good energy source, but it must be well dried. It is also useful for cleaning your dog's teeth and for keeping them in good condition. Pasta and rice are very useful, but as we have already said, they should be cooked very well to eliminate starch, which is not easily digested. Fruit and vegetables, even if not essential, can be given to dogs that appreciate them. However, the nutritional intake is very slight and is only worthy of note for the intake of roughage. Needless to say, the final element which is essential to nutrition is water, fresh and plentiful, that must be available at all times. If in a bowl, it should be changed as often as possible, especially during hot spells. It is absolutely indispensable to dogs that eat dry and not moistened feed. The final aspect of the diet to take into consideration is the frequency of meals. From birth, puppies have their meals by following times that are spaced out by the instinct of the mother and the other siblings in the litter. The feeds are gradually reduced during weaning and are integrated with suitable foods that should be recommended by an experienced breeder or a vet. Between one and three months of age, weaned puppies should have four meals at regular intervals. From four to seven or eight months, the number of meals can be reduced to three, further reduced to two meals at eight to 18 months, and afterwards, if desired, down to just one meal a day, even if it is not harmful to continue with two. On the contrary, this is recommended by certain individuals. The decision to have a dog is an important one to make, which must be thought over carefully without ignoring some useful basic information. The vaccination prophylaxis must always be carried out with utmost care to try and protect not only the puppies but also adult dogs from the most common illnesses. Generally speaking, a puppy leaves the breeder after having been vaccinated at around 40 to 45 days with a triad vaccine against canine distemper, infectious hepatitis and parvovirus. A second quadrivalent vaccination, also including leptospirosis as well as the three ailments already mentioned, is generally carried out after three weeks. An additional vaccination can be carried out after a month, again quadrivalent, to be then replaced annually throughout the dog's lifespan. A dog can be vaccinated only if it is in perfect health and thus also free from endoparasites. Appropriate anti-helminthic treatment must be carried out normally twice a year. Different types of ascarids exist, each of which specifically infests an animal species, man included, and there is practically no risk of zoonosis, that is, transmission of the infestation from dog to man. It is important that dogs are also kept free from ectoparasites, that is, those that live on dogs such as fleas and mites, both of which are hematophages. Moreover, fleas act as an intermediate host for a type of taenia. Numerous specific products exist to free dogs from these annoying parasites, but one must not forget to also carry out appropriate disinfesting operations in the areas where dogs live.
the arrival of spring exacerbates the problems caused by undesired guests, the mites that arrive along with the initial spring warmth. A run in the meadows through woods, perhaps near groups of farmhouses and farms where there is livestock, can result in our canine friend returning home with mites, not necessarily since some factors may exist which make a dog more or less susceptible, also depending on its general state of health that can influence whether or not a dog will pick up these akari. They represent a grave danger to dogs because they transmit pyroplasmosis, a serious infection carried by protozoa of the pyroplasma species that affects pets and also causes death if not discovered and treated in time. The symptoms in its acute form are represented by fever, also sthenic, asthenia, pallor of the apparent mucous membranes, and hypochromia of the urine that can also become brown-black in colour. In advanced cases, jaundice and a comatose state which could possibly result in death. The mites suck blood for two or three weeks and once having mated, the female then detaches itself from the animal and deposits the eggs a week later. The deposited larvae, recognisable by their reddish colour, are minute, like tiny beads. They also look for a host on which to climb, sucking blood for several days. They then detach themselves and after a few days change into octopede nymphs of bluish colour. They become adults towards August or September. With the arrival of autumn, the adults immediately upon hatching then lay dormant in cracks in the ground until the next spring. In general, the mites attach themselves to less thick skin, such as ears, armpits, groin, between the digits of the paws. Therefore, as a precautionary measure, we should always examine our canine friends for signs of any undesired guests after a walk in the open. Correct dog hygiene starts with coat care. For most breeds, but not all, it is advisable to brush the coat almost daily in order to remove the hairs that have reached the end of their life cycle. The coat of many breeds requires specialised grooming which is to be carried out several times a year. One must not generalise about the fact that a shiny coat is a sign of good health, since in some breeds it should have a tendency to be dull. Dogs must not be washed too often so as not to damage the protective function of the sebaceous glands. The skin in normal conditions should always look clean without dandruff deposits or desquamations of any kind. Should cutaneous alterations appear, such as eczema, alopecic areas, i.e. hair loss and failure of hair regrowth, thickening or the appearance of abnormal pigmentation, consult your vet without delay. Cutaneous alterations due to mycosis or mange are spread by contagion, but only in the case of particularly debilitated animals and when one fails to observe the most basic hygienic rules. Claws must also be checked periodically. These are normally worn down in dogs that undergo normal physical activities, but it may be necessary to shorten them with the aid of a special tool. Oral hygiene should never be overlooked, and especially in miniature breeds, tartar removal is necessary from time to time because it can cause pyorrhea and bad breath. Certain bones are available on the market that besides constituting a treat for our four-legged friend, act as a natural toothbrush. In puppies aged between four and six months, the deciduous dentition is gradually replaced by the permanent one. Regular inspections of the mouth are advisable during this period to check that everything is okay. The existence of cardiopulmonary filariasis, a serious disease caused by a nematode parasite, Dyrofilaria imitis, or the blood and heart, has been known for several centuries, as has been known the important transmission mechanism of the disease by the mosquito for about a century. However, it is only in the last 20 years, due to the rapid diffusion of filariasis in dogs kept for company and work dogs, that research institutes, pharmaceutical companies and vets have paid increasing attention to the problem. It is therefore important that dog owners are also aware, even if in general terms, of the existence and phenomena of the parasitosis. The transmission of the disease occurs through the mosquito's sting, which takes up the filaria larvae by sucking blood from an infected subject to then inoculate them into another healthy dog. The high contagiousness of the parasitosis is therefore easily understandable, in addition to its seasonality, spring-summer. 
During a period of around six months, the larvae in the dog's blood grow into adult worms that are situated in the heart and pulmonary arteries. In turn, the adult filariae produce small larvae called microfilariae, which will live in the blood. The dogs most affected are obviously those that spend more or less long periods outside, hence gun dogs, work dogs, and those that sleep in the open. The damage induced by the presence of the filariae is of considerable seriousness for that which concerns the cardiocirculatory function and initially shown as a tendency for dogs to tire easily and the presence of a cough or respiratory dysfunction. The vet giving treatment at this stage will perform different clinical and laboratory tests that will confirm the presence of the parasites. On the contrary, the damage caused by chronic cardiopulmonary filariasis is extremely serious. The alteration of the cardiocirculatory function is often accompanied by liver and kidney lesions and a state of generalized hypersensitivity in the whole organism. The prevention programs that have only been practicable for a few years thanks to the use of specific new drugs are simple to carry out and do not involve toxicity risks for dogs. After having carried out a test to ensure the absence of a previous infestation, the oral administration of a medicine once a month for the duration of the entire hot season will give dogs effective protection also if they are stung by an infected mosquito. It is not easy to establish the origins of this breed, which is recognized in the Fédération Sinologique Internationale as native to the ex-Yugoslavia. The name itself seems to derive from Dalmatia, where the ancestors of this dog arrived from the east, or perhaps from nearby Greece, to be crossbred with the local Istrian pointer. It is probable that the ancient branch from which it originates has very remote roots, and this can be deduced from relics of Oriental, Greek and Egyptian civilizations, on which dogs with a very similar coat to the modern Dalmatian were depicted. Some experts suggest that The Dalmatian. The Dalmatian is truly unique, beginning with its characteristic spotted coat, which led the breed to cinema celebrity, thanks to the Walt Disney cartoon 101 Dalmatians. Scientists have also discovered that the red blood cells of the Dalmatian are not round like those of other dogs, but oval like a camel. Moreover, the Dalmatian eliminates between 400 and 600 milligrams of uric acid per day, a quantity way above that of all other breeds, which eliminate between 10 and 60 milligrams per day. The ancestor of the Dalmatian, saying that once it reached the coasts of Dalmatia with the invading Alani, it crossbred with local dogs, undergoing a somatic change. This theory was accepted by many, above all in France, where the dog was once known as the Petit Danois, or Little Dane, with obvious reference to the Harlequin Great Dane. In the 50s, the Dalmatian was also known as the Chien Courant de Dalmati, Chien Courant being a scent hound, and this suggests that originally the dog was mainly used for hunting. between the scent hound of the southern counties and a greyhound white with small black spots. In 1792, the sinologist Thomas Berwick suggests that the breed originates from Dalmatia and describes the elegant form between a foxhound and a setter, but with a longer, narrower skull and a white coat with small, irregular black or liver-colored spots. The pure breed has brown cheeks and black ears and is much smaller in size than the Great Dane. Other authors indicate the Great Dane in its ancient form as it descends from a now extinct Asian breed, the Bengali Brak, which had a spotted coat on a tan base, not white. This dog may be the one mentioned by Linnaeus as the Canis variegatus and depicted in Eastern monuments.
An English sinologist writing under the pseudonym of Eidston mentions an antique print dated 1556 showing a dog with a lean but solid skeleton, described as somewhat